we are in our third week of our series, What Not to Do in a Horror Movie. Now, I've got to admit, I've never been a big fan of scary movies. Just, just the generic scary movies have never scared me. And it's like, okay, cool, that guy's about to die, whatever, no big deal. But I don't mess around with, like, demon possession movies. No, it's not, not going to happen. I watched The uh, Exorcism of Emily Rose when I was a sophomore in college in my dorm room by myself, and that one haunted me for a while. Uh, the, uh, the girl I was dating at the time looked like the actress that got possessed. I was like, no, we, no, this is over. I can't have demons in my life. And so that relationship ended. Uh, just, she broke up with me. Just kidding. I didn't. I just wanted to, just needed to get that out there. But there's one movie that, that, uh, that has stuck with me that I do enjoy, and it's the movie Scream. Is anyone familiar with the movie Scream? came out in the mid-'90s. Uh, now, I wasn't allowed to watch this movie at home. My parents rated our movies not going to happen. Uh, they made an exception for The Passion of the Christ. I don't really know why, but that one, that rated R movie was okay. Um, but rated R movies weren't going to happen, so I would go over to my buddy's house, and I'd watch it at his house, like any good middle schooler. I, just, I can't do it at my house. I'll go over to your house. But his parents didn't allow him to watch rated R movies as well. But he got to watch it as much as he wanted when the babysitter was over there. And so I would go over there when the babysitter was over there because I got to hung, hang out with one of my best friends. I also went over there when the babysitter was over there because the babysitter was my oldest sister. She was the one who let us do kind of whatever we wanted, rated our movies, sure, staying up as late as we want, absolutely. Uh, Missy, I don't know if you're watching. What's wrong with you? Come on, get it together. But in that movie, there's a guy, a character, who has three rules for a scary movie. And one of the rules is never say, I'll be right back. If you say, I'll be right back, you're going to die. You're not coming back. And so it's one of those things like we're in a series, what not to do in a scary movie or not what not to do in a horror movie. And so I'm going to piggyback off that one, right? This guy's saying, don't say, I'll be right back. You've got to be very careful with your words. And so today, that's the direction we're going. We've got to be careful with our words. If you've got your Bible, if you have our app, If you haven't downloaded our app, you can check out all the events that I was talking about before. You can go back and watch past sermons. You can give. You can see everything that's going on. We also have our sermon notes on the app, just Foundations Church uh, Tulsa. Just search it in the app store. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, reading verse 33 through 37. It says this. It says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good tree or a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. As we're talking about being mindful of our words, being careful of our words, the first thing I would say about our words, our language, our vocabulary is this, what you say shows what you are. What you say shows what you are. Jesus lays it out pretty clear. He says a good tree produces what? Good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruits. There you go. He also says whatever is in your heart determines what you say. That what you produce, you either produce good things from the good stored up in your heart or you produce evil things from the evil stored up in your heart. A friend of mine phrased it like this. He said, your words paint a picture of the condition of your heart. Your words paint a picture of the condition of your heart. Now, when Jesus is talking, when he's, when he's talking in Matthew 12, do you know who his audience is? He's talking to the Pharisees. Now, in our mind, we think of Pharisees as these guys who aren't connecting what's up here to what's in here. Right? They're, not, they're not able to really live out what it means to love God. They're more concerned about following the law. But in the culture, the Pharisees were the examples. They were the ones who knew the law. They were the ones who had it all together. They were the ones that were supposed to be the role models of what it meant. They were the good guys. And Jesus sees right through that facade and calls out what's going on. And he, he could have called them out even if he was blind because he wasn't watching what they were doing. He was what? He was listening to what they were saying. The Pharisees had just seen Jesus perform a miracle. They had just seen him cast out a demon. They had, they had seen undeniable proof that Jesus was the son of God, that he had authority over the spiritual world. And they say, you did that by the power of Satan. Now, we can think of it and be like, man, they're so stupid. They missed the boat, those dummies. Bless their little hearts, they just missed it. But Jesus makes it clear it's not a lack, it's not ignorance, it's evil. It's not them 
being dumb, it's because their hearts were not in a good condition. And what they believed, who they were on the inside was bubbling up in their speech. Have you guys ever had that happen where you're in a conversation and something slips and you're like, oh, I forgot that was in there. Anyone else? Just me? No? Okay. Um, when I was in high school, because I'm not going to give a recent example, lest you think that I'm not qualified to speak up here. I, uh, when I was in high school, my dad picked me up, and we were driving home, and he was just making small talk. Hey, how was your day? What was going on? And nothing overly exciting had happened that day. Uh, my biology teacher, Coach Hatfield, had kind of got into it with one of, one of the students, just one of these idiot boys who thinks he knows everything. And so the coach is kind of going back and forth with him. And so I'm telling my dad about the story. And as I'm telling him about what happened, I'm thinking this story isn't real exciting, and so I try to spice it up a little bit, and I'm, yeah, I said, yeah, Coach Hatfield said blankety-blank to him, and about that time, we pulled up to a stoplight, and my dad looked at me, and he goes, did your coach really say that? And I knew my dad to know that if I said yes, he would call the school and be like, why do you have coaches, why do you have teachers cussing out students in class? And so I didn't want to dig myself in a hole any deeper, and I said, no, he didn't really say that. And my dad just looked at me and goes, don't ever let your mother hear you say something like that again. It's like, yes, sir, noted, right? But what happened was what was on the inside was bubbling up in my speech, was coming out in my vocabulary, because who I was at school was way different than who I was at home in church. The way that I talked at school would never fly in the way that I talked at home or in church. And so I tried to hide it, but eventually it came out in my language. And this is what's happening with the Pharisees. Jesus sees them for who they really are. And what does he call them? He calls them a brood of snakes, which literally means like the offspring of a snake. You son of a snake, right, is what Jesus is saying to these guys. And I want you to read these these passages with me in Psalms chapter 140, verses 1 through 3. And let's see if we can figure out why Jesus is calling them snakes. This is a psalm from David. Oh, Lord, rescue me from evil people. Protect me from those who are violent, those who plot evil in their hearts and stir up trouble all day long. Their tongues sting like a snake. The venom of viper drips from their lips. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 13. Their talk is foul, like stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Let's look at James chapter 3. You guys are probably familiar with some passage, some some, uh, variation of this. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. You guys seen a pattern here? Proverbs 18, 21 says this. The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk can reap the consequences. Jesus is, is no, knows what the Pharisees are thinking, and he calls them out because they're evil. If we want to go all the way back to Genesis, what tempts the woman into eating the fruit. A snake. What does the snake use? It uses his words. Right from the beginning of time, these two go hand in hand, that the snake is evil, and that these words have power, that their words can be deadly, these words can bring life, or these words can bring death. And Jesus saw that they were hate-filled men who were spewing death, who were spewing poison with their words. Now, what does this have to do with us? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. I think this is a pretty stern warning for any of us who can't control our words, who can't control our language, right? Because what we say shows others what we are. Are we a good tree or are we a bad tree? Do we have a treasury of good in our heart? Do we have a treasury of evil in our heart? Your language paints that picture. You see, you and I have the privilege, we have the responsibility, we have the honor of glorifying God, of pointing people to him and all that we do, even in our language, But so often, instead of spreading the good news, instead of speaking life, we spew poison and death with our language. It's not just the Pharisees, it's us. How do we do this? Michael, I've never told anyone to kill themselves. I've never been, okay, good, that's a great place to start. But we overlook sin like gossip. Oh man, we will... We will call somebody out if they've had an affair, if, if, they've, if there's a moral failure. We'd be like, oh my gosh, that piece of garbage. I can't believe that they would do that. But we don't think twice whenever we're gossiping about someone else. No difference in God's eyes. We'll lie. And say, I'm just doing what I need to do to get by. Just a little white lie. I just, I'm just trying to take care of my, I'm just, just a little lie. We'll use inappropriate language and be like, that's just what happens when I get angry. 
We'll tell inappropriate jokes. That's, it's funny. It's funny. It's funny, but is it beneficial? It's funny, but is it right? And, and these words have the power of life and death. And we excuse them, not thinking anything about them. We read James 3, 7 and 8. Let's read James 3, verses 9 and 10. It says, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, talking about our words, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessings and cursings come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. This isn't right. This isn't the way that we need to be speaking. Who's it talking to? To those of us that say we are Christ followers but can't control our language, that is not the right way to live. We're being modern-day Pharisees. And Jesus is saying, you're showing yourself. You're showing your cards by what you say. You can lie to yourself and say you're a good person, but Jesus is saying if the tree isn't producing good fruit, it's a bad tree. A few years ago, um, God really convicted me in the way that I speak. Uh, just, just a background, I will always go for the laugh. I will always try, like, you guys have a, like a little light, an indicator on your refrigerator that tells you when you need to change your filter? Like, I've got one. It's been red for months. I don't know why. Uh, I'm just, I, literally, it's me going on Amazon and clicking and it coming a couple days later. Um, I, I've got a filter that I think the light has burned out, right? I've just ignored it, and it's the filter from my brain to my mouth. And, 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 and so I, have to, I have to be very, very intentional about not letting what ha- happens up here come out in my mouth because I will always go for what's funny. If sarcasm was a spiritual gift, um, I could teach classes on it. I, I have that ability, and I have to rein it in, and sometimes it gets the best of me. But a few years ago, God really convicted me on my speech, and very specifically in regards to the way that I preached. Now, um, I remember exactly where I was. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was going over a message for youth that I had prepared. Um, I was going over it like I always do. And as I'm going through it, it just doesn't pop. There's not, I'm like, there were times where I'm like, that will get a laugh, that will get a laugh, that'll be funny, that'll kind of like throw some shock value. And I'm going through it, and I literally think this thought I was like, man, I get through with it, and I go, that's not very funny. And almost immediately, Holy Spirit, I've had very few moments in my life where I felt the Holy Spirit just kind of slap me in the face. And it felt like that was one of those moments. And just immediately after I thought, this isn't very funny, the Holy Spirit said, I didn't call you to be a comedian. I was like, okay, noted. I had ignored passages like James 3. Do you know how James 3 starts? Like, James 3, 1, it says, not many of you should seek to be teachers because you're going to be held to a higher standard. And then immediately goes into talking about controlling our language. I'd never put those together. I had ignored passages like 1 Peter 4, 11, if you have the gift of speaking, speak as though God were speaking through you. So in that way you honor and glorify God in all that you do. I'd miss that. I was more concerned with, is this funny instead of is this honoring and glorifying God? I had missed uh, the Holy Spirit in person, a.k.a. my wife, uh, telling me not to say stuff. I remember a Sunday morning I made a joke and she goes, don't say that second service. And I'm like, don't tell me what to do, right? And I say it. And so I've missed God's word. I've missed my wife. And so God's like, all right, we're about to have a sit down meeting. Let's go. And convicted me in regards to the way that I preached. I found myself in, in an attempt to be funny, an attempt to be relevant, an attempt to be entertaining. I would insult people I would degrade people. I would toe this line of what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. And ultimately what I was doing is I was sinning while I was preaching. You're like, Michael, that's pretty harsh. It's it's honest. It's the truth of what I was doing. And so here's what I will say. If 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 whenever I get a chance to speak, if you're like, uh, just roll your eyes, here comes Michael, boring, right? If you're online and you're just like, see the bald guy and you log off, you guys are kind of stuck. If I see you walking away, I'll be like, no, don't leave, right? Um But if you see me and you're like, oh, this one's going to be kind of dull, this one's going to be kind of boring, I make no apologies because I'm not trying to win the approval of anyone else other than God. That's, that's, my goal is not to make you laugh. My goal is what Paul said is, is to preach Christ and him crucified because that is what changed lives. My stupid jokes don't change anything, but Christ does. 
And so he, he had convicted me in that, and he still works on me in, in my, my everyday language. And, and, and there's times where I'm like, God damn it, why did I say that? And maybe you're in the same boat where you know that the way that you talk about other people, the way that you talk to people, the way that you talk when you stub your toe, talk about painting the picture of my heart, right? Um, the way that you talk, I get it. There are those moments of weakness, but the difference is, in one instance, we, we negate it and we neglect it and we're like, it's no big deal. The other instance is we recognize it and we repent and we pursue God. That there is a big difference. But here's the, on our own, we cannot control our tongue. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 16 and, and read this. It says, don't you realize that you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. See, on our own, we can't control our words, we can't control our thoughts, we can't control our actions, right? And we're going to submit to that sinful nature each and every time because we are slaves to sin. But once we come under the authority and once we come into submission for, to God, then guess what? Then we become slaves to righteous living. And so then our words and our habits and our actions and our thoughts and, and, and our desires begin to be patterned after him and begin to line up in a way that honors him and glorifies him in all that we do, right? Yes, there will still be those moments of weakness, but in those moments of weakness, we realize how far we are from perfect and how, how ugly our sin is in the sight of a holy God. And so instead of just excusing it, that's who I am, we say, God, forgive me, and we continue to pursue him. Why? Because sin is not our master anymore. We are obedient to God. That sin, that inability to fix ourselves is the reason Jesus came to the earth. We, we owed an impossible debt that we could not pay. And so Jesus came, took our place, and his blood covers our sins and gives us the power over sin, puts us in right standing with God. But on our own, we are slaves to sin and we will never be able to control our tongue. And when we excuse it, we make light of the sacrifice that Jesus made. When we excuse it, when we just say, that's just who I am, right? I was just born this way. I, that, that excuse for sin, I was just born this way, is the most scripturally ignorant excuse there ever could be. I was born a sinner too. Read John 3. We're supposed to be what? Born again. How do you miss that? I was just born this way. I don't care. We were all born one way. Maybe you were born rude and mean and, and cynical and hateful. Guess what? In Christ, you're born again, and you are a new creation. The old is gone. So stop using the excuse, I was born this way. I'm just a realist. I don't care. Read the Bible and, and listen to what Jesus said, that you are born again. You are a transformed person. With a transformed life comes new passions, comes new desires, comes new habits, comes new attitudes that allow us to pursue the life that Christ has called us to live. I was born one way. Great. So was I. But in Christ, I'm a new creation. I'm born again. Stop using that excuse. Man, the most basic way to examine the condition of someone's heart, listen to the words they say. Are their words, are your words, are my words glorifying God? Are they honoring him? Are they speaking life or are they speaking death? Or are they poison? We've got to be careful with what we say, which leads me to my last point is this. Are our words thoughtlessly spoken or are they carefully counted? Are our words thoughtlessly spoken or are they carefully counted? Now, we've got something in the last couple of, of verses that we read in Matthew 12 that should cause us um, to pause and, and really, it's a humbling reality of what Jesus is saying here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. Jesus says this, And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Every idle word. Really? I want you to think about this past week and just think about the idle words. The, the word idle means lazy, it means thoughtless, it means careless. Just think about what you've said. Doesn't, you're, not, you're not probably like patting yourself on the back. Good job, right? You're probably like, ooh. Now think of everything you've ever said. <laughs> There's a lot there. If you're, in a, if you're in a courtroom, you are building the case against yourself. We've talked about some of those words. We've talked about a gossip. We've talked about lying. We've talked about um, the inappropriate language. But what about some of the ones that we might overlook a little bit? Some of the ones that maybe seem kind of innocent. Turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, pray like this. 
Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your name be kept holy. God's name is holy. It's perfect. It deserves reverence and deserves respect. What do you, how many times have you used the name Jesus Christ in a way that doesn't honor him? How many, how many times have you just said, oh, Jesus? You say it lightly, but it's never meant to be taken lightly. It's idle words. You're like, Michael, you're being kind of harsh, being kind of legalistic. Am I? Or are we going to have to give an account for all these words? I go through my bank account a couple times a week to make sure there aren't any like fraudulent charges. And I go through, I keep an account of my bank. Do we keep an account of our words? Do we carefully monitor and carefully weigh our words? Or are we just throwing them out there, whatever we want? Are we keeping God's name holy? Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Always be full of joy in the Lord. In the Lord, I say it again, rejoice. I know a lot of grumpy, angry Christians who are mad because they aren't getting their way in life. Man, if God really knew what he was doing, I wouldn't be in this position that I'm in. I love the book of Job, and I love getting to Job 38 because I kind of chuckle. Have you guys ever, like, witnessed someone getting in trouble and you're in the back and you're like, (laughs) like you're laughing? I love it because it gets to Job 38, and Job's been complaining and, and griping. In Job 38, God goes, all right. Listen up. If you're such a man, you've got all these questions, prepare yourselves for the answers. He says, where were you when I was creating the earth? Where were you when I laid the foundations? Where were you when I told the ocean it could only go this way? Where were you? And I love it. And I'm I'm like, "Eh, Joe, what an idiot. And the whole time, I'm like, man, I'm the same way. I'm like, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why do all my unsaved friends get to have all the fun? What, is that full of joy in the Lord, or is it idle words, idle thoughts? Something I have to give an account for. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this. It says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. What's running through your mind as you're going on, home on 169 at 430 on a Tuesday afternoon? You encouraging people? What's that look like? Encouraging them to get out of the left lane, Grandma. Let's go. I got to get home. I don't know about you, but I find it very awkward, one, to be encouraged, and two, to encourage other people. I don't know why. Maybe it's just me. There are some of you that are natural encouragers, and I love being around you. Uh, we've got some friends who, thank God, they have that, that gifting. They have that on their lives, and it makes me feel good. Um, but I've got, like, three encouragements. It's like, did you get a new haircut? Have you lost weight? And that's a nice shirt. Like, those are the three, like, that I can go to, right? I don't have a whole lot. You know what's a lot easier for me to do is to make fun of people, to tear people down, to go for the joke, go for what's funny. But what's First Thessalonians 5? It says encourage each other, build each other up. I think James was on to something in the first chapter of his book, James 1.19. He says this. He says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You all must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Slow to speak. I woke up and my nose was like, hey, I'm still here, so thank you for uh, your your patience with that. Um, It's so tempting for us to spout off the first thing that comes to our mind. So tempting. What's the Bible say? We've got to be slow to speak. It's so tempting to just blah, blah, our emotions and our feelings and man, people are like, no, you've got it. idle words, carefully weighed, slow to speak. Comments towards other people, people you may never know. Aubrey and I have had this conversation amongst ourselves. We're watching TV and we're like, oh, gross, what are they wearing? They'll never know what I said. Those people don't care about me, but am I showing my cards? Am I showing my heart? Idle words, not carefully weighed, not slow to speak. Quick to give my opinion. Does my opinion honor God? Does it build others up? Does it glorify him? Is it speaking life? Not really. Showing my heart, showing who I am. Jesus say the words that we say will either condemn us or acquit us. We already are condemned. We're already in sin. The Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all missed the mark. We're already condemned. The words that we say are just adding more fuel to the fire. But he says something that's really interesting that I've never really caught. He says the words that we say 
will acquit us. What words would those be? It'd be our confession of faith in Christ. It'd be our belief in him, saying that Jesus is Lord. But can I tell you that even that confession of Christ has to be carefully counted and not thoughtlessly spoken. What do I mean by that? I've got three questions to ask you guys as we're wrapping up. The first thing is this. Have we counted the cost of what a confession of faith really looks like? Have we counted the cost of what a confession of faith really looks like? Do we understand the weight of what we are saying? Right? At the end of service, I say, hey, I don't want this to be an emotional decision. It's easy for us to say Jesus is Lord when it doesn't cost us anything, but I want us to read Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. I think I only had like 25 through 28, so I'll just read it for you. So the large crowd was following Jesus, and he turned around and said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, how many of you guys want to be a disciple of Jesus? Yeah, a couple of you. You're like, I don't know. Let me finish this passage before I raise my hand on that. He said, if any of you wants to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. Then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the army of 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you, listen, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Have you counted the cost of what a confession really looks like? Next question. Do we view our relationship with Jesus as an addition to our lives or as a submission to the king? How do we view that relationship? If it's an addition to, then our desires stay the same. We just claim to have a different source, right? So we're like, yes, Jesus, make me wealthy. You own the cattle on a thousand hills, right? Bless this lottery ticket, amen. If our desires stay the same, but we just have a different source, we're like, Jesus, make me healthy. I'm putting down men's health and turning off Dr. Oz or whatever, right? And I'm turning to you, right? If, if it's the same desires but a different source, then instead of searching LinkedIn, we go through the Bible and try to justify us looking for another job, right? It, it's same desires, different source. There's no real cost involved. And we live in a country where we don't have the threat of being arrested all right, when you leave here, there's not police waiting to throw you in jail because you're Christians. And honestly, it's very, very easy to say, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. There's no cost involved. It hasn't, costed, hasn't cost me anything. Jesus is Lord. Big deal. Do you know the New Testament, when the Roman Empire was ruling, that Caesar was Lord? He was in charge. Caesar was Lord. And so for someone to make a profession of faith in Christ and say, Jesus is Lord, That was considered treason, and you could be thrown in jail or executed because of that confession, because no one is Lord except Caesar. And so it cost them something. So that confession they made immediately, like, had ramifications, and they would not say it lightly. But saying it here, what's the cost? What if your confession of faith meant that your dreams and your hopes had to die? What if your confession of faith meant that the plans that you had, I've got, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and this, I'm going to retire at this age. What if that meant that that was shelved to follow the plan God had for your life? Would you still make that confession of faith? Would you still count the cost? Or would you be like, uh, I'm good. We read in the Bible that Jesus came to give us life and give it to the fullest. I want an abundant life. Yes, Lord, blessed and highly favored. What does Jesus say he is? He says, I am the way, the truth, and what? the life. We have taken that verse out of context to mean that we get better home, better job, better cars, better health, better vacation, retire, have a great life. That's not what that verse means. It said, I came to give you an abundant life, not an abundant lifestyle. Jesus says, I came that you may have me and have all that I have to offer. If Jesus is life and he came that we may have life, he means that we came, that he came so we can have everything he offers, that we can have joy overflowing joy in the midst of despair, that we can have overwhelming hope in the midst of darkness, that we can have overwhelming and overflowing goodness in the midst of evil, 
that we can have uh, overflowing peace in the midst of chaos. Do you get what I'm saying here? The gospel that so many of us have bought into is such an American, unbiblical view of Christianity, and we're exporting this all over the world. The gospel means good news, but what we are exporting is fake news, right? So try selling that Jesus wants to give you an abundant life, just more, more, more. Try selling that to the underground church in China. Try selling that to the churches in the Middle East who are being executed for their faith. Try selling that to the churches in Ukraine who are like, God wants to give you more. And you're like, bro, my house was just destroyed. My family was just killed. We have to get out of this mindset that following Jesus is just about us. No, it's about glorifying him and honoring him. And and, and our way of living ceases and we pick up our cross and follow him, that we submit to what he wants. You can't be my disciple Unless you count the cost, you can't be my disciple unless you pick up your cross and die to yourself. The cross is not a cool piece of jewelry that we wear. It's a means of execution, that you are dying to your old self and following him. The last thing is this. Is that confession of faith, is it God-birthed or is it you-centered? If it's God-birthed, there's going to be evidence. You look at Galatians 5. There's going to be evidence of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control in your life. There's going to be evidence and a desire to pursue him a desire to pursue holiness. There's going to be evidence that when you sin, there is a recognition of that sin. There is repentance, and there is a continued push towards becoming more and more like Christ. If it's God's birth, and even after counting the cost, laying down your life, you are still willing to pick up your cross and follow him because he is the true source of life. Have you counted the cost? Are you living with an addition to or submission to? Is that confession God birthed or is it you centered? Read in Galatians 2, verse 20, one of my favorite verses. It says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. God, and we thank you that you are the true source of life. That you came so that we could have all that you have to offer. God, I pray that our lives would honor you. That our lives would glorify you. That our hearts would seek after you. God, the words that we say would be life-giving. They would be encouraging. They would be joy-filled words. That words are a reflection of our heart and a heart that is in tune with you. God, I pray that you would forgive us for those words that have torn down, those words that have brought death, those words that have have gone against you, those idle words. God, that you would forgive us, that you would make us acutely aware of our language. God, that it would point people to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.